Part two, chapter five of En Route by Jorical Heismans, translated by Charles Keegan Paul. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Rising somewhat earlier than his wont, Durtal went down to the chapel. The office of matins was over, but some lay brothers, amongst whom was Brother Simeon, were praying on their knees on the ground. The sight of this holy swineherd threw Durtal into a long train of thought he tried in vain to penetrate into the sanctuary of that soul hidden like an invisible chapel behind the dunghill rampart of a body he did not even succeed in representing to himself the docile and clinging soul of this man who had attained the highest state to which the human creature can reach here below what a power of prayer he has thought he as he looked at the old man he remembered the details of his interview the evening before it is true he thought that in this monk i find something of the charm of that brother juniper whose surprising simplicity has come down through the ages and he brought to mind the adventures of that franciscan whom his companions left one day by himself in the convent telling him to prepare dinner against their return juniper reflected what an amount of time is spent in preparing food the brothers who take turns in that work have not even time to pray and desiring to lighten the work of those who should succeed him in the kitchen he determined to cook such plentiful dishes that the community might dine on them for a fortnight he lighted all the stoves procured we are not told how enormous boilers filled them with water threw into them pell-mell eggs with their shells chickens with their feathers vegetables he had neglected to trim and before a fire which would roast an ox he exerted himself to pile up and stir the ridiculous jumble of his stock-pots when the brothers came home and sat down in the refectory he ran his face browned and his hands burnt and joyously served up his stew the superior asked him if he were not mad while he remained stupefied that no one gobbled up this astonishing mess he declared in all humility that he thought he was doing a service to his brethren and only when he observed that so much food would be wasted did he weep hot tears and declare himself a wretch he cried that he was good for nothing but to spoil the property of almighty god while the monks smiled admiring this debauch of charity and the excess of juniper's simplicity brother simeon would be humble enough and simple enough to renew again such splendid jokes thought durtal but better still than the good franciscan he recalls the memory of that astonishing saint joseph of cupertino of whom the oblate spoke yesterday he who called himself brother ass was a charming and poor creature so modest and so ignorant that he was turned away wherever he went he passed through life with open mouth thrusting himself eagerly against all the cloisters that repulsed him he wandered about unable to perform even the lowest tasks he was to use a popular expression a regular butterfingers and broke whatever he touched they ordered him to go and fetch water and he wandered without understanding absorbed in god and at the end when no one thought about it any more brought some after a month a monastery of capucins which had received him got rid of him he went his way vaguely out of his orbit among the towns stumbled into another convent where he employed himself in taking care of the animals whom he adored and he rose into a perpetual ecstasy revealing himself as the most singular of wonder-workers putting the demons to flight and healing the sick he was at once idiotic and sublime in the hagiography he stands alone and seems to figure there to furnish a proof that the soul is identified with eternal wisdom rather by ignorance than by science he also loves animals said durtal to himself as he looked at old simeon and he too puts to flight the evil one and works cures by his sanctity in a time when all men are exclusively haunted by the thoughts of luxury and lucre the soul appears extraordinary when divested of its bark as the candid and naked soul of this good monk he is eighty years old and more and he has led from his youth up the restricted life of the trappists he probably does not know in what time he lives nor what latitudes he inhabits whether he is in america or in france for he has never read a newspaper and outside rumours do not reach him he does not even know the taste of flesh meat or wine he has no notion of money of which he does not suspect the value nor the appearance he does not imagine how a woman is made and save for the breeding of his pigs he perhaps cannot even guess the meaning and the consequences of the sin of the flesh he lives alone ringed round by silence and buried in the shade he meditates on the mortifications of the fathers in the desert which are read to him as he eats and the frenzy of their fasts makes him ashamed of his miserable repast and he accuses himself that he is so well to do 
ah this father simeon is innocent he knows nothing that we know and knows that of which all others are ignorant his education has been taken in hand by the lord himself who teaches him truths which we cannot comprehend models his soul after heaven infuses himself into him possesses him and deifies him in the union of blessedness this puts us somewhat at a distance from hypocrites and devout persons as far indeed as modern catholicism is from mysticism for certainly that religion is as grovelling on the ground as mysticism is high and that is true instead of directing all our forces to that unknown end of taking our soul to fashion it in that form of a dove which the middle ages gave to the pixers instead of making it the shrine where the host reposes in the very image of the holy spirit the catholic confines himself to trying to conceal his conscience to deceive his judge by the fear of a salutary hell he acts not by choice but by fear he with the aid of his clergy and the help of his imbecile literature and his feeble press has made of religion a mere fetishism a ridiculous worship composed of statuettes and arms boxes candles and chromolithographs he has materialized the ideal of love in inventing an entirely physical devotion to the sacred heart what baseness of conception continued durtal who had come out of the chapel and was strolling along the bank of the great pond he looked at the reeds which bent like an harvest still green under a puff of wind then he half saw as he leant forward an old boat which bore almost effaced on its bluish hull the name alleluia this bark disappeared under the tufts of leaves round which were twined the bells of the convolvulus a symbolic flower since it widens out like a chalice and has the dead white of a wafer the scent of the water at once enticing and bitter intoxicated him ah he thought happiness certainly consists in being restricted to a place closely locked a prison very confined or a chapel always open and he caught himself up ah there is brother anacletus the lay brother was coming towards him bending under a hamper he passed before durtal smiling at him with his eyes and while he went his way durtal thought this man is a true friend of mine when i was suffering so much before my confession he expressed all to me in a look to-day when he believes me serener and more joyous he is content and shows it to me by a smile and i shall never speak to him i shall never thank him i shall never even know who he is i shall perhaps never even see him again in leaving this place i shall keep a friend for whom i too feel affection yet neither of us has even exchanged a gesture with the other after all he thought does not this absolute reserve make our friendship more perfect it is stamped in the eternal distance it remains mysterious and incomplete and more certain while thinking over these reflections durtal went towards the chapel where the office called him and thence to the refectory he was surprised to find the table laid only for one what has happened to monsieur bruno yet i may as well wait a while and to kill time he occupied himself by reading a printed card hung upon the wall it was a sort of advertisement which began thus eternity fellow sinners you will die be ye always ready watch then pray without ceasing never forget the four last things which you see here traced death the gate of eternity judgment which decides eternity hell the abode of unhappy eternity paradise the abode of blessed eternity father Etienne interrupted durtal telling him that monsieur bruno had gone to saint landry to make some purchases and would only return at bedtime at eight o'clock dine then without waiting and make haste or all your dishes will be cold and how is the father abbot better he keeps his room still but he hopes to be able to come down a while the day after tomorrow and assist at least at some of the officers and the monk bowed and disappeared durtal seated himself at table ate some bean broth swallowed a soft boiled egg and a spoonful of warm beans then once outside he passed along the chapel entered it and knelt before the altar of the virgin but at once the spirit of blasphemy filled him he wished whatever it cost him to insult the virgin it seemed to him that he would experience a sharp joy an acute pleasure in soiling her but he restrained himself he wrinkled his face not to allow the coal heaver's abuse which was on his lips to escape and he detested these abominations he revolted against them strove against them with horror and the impulse became so irresistible that in order to keep silence he was obliged to bite his lips till they bled 
this is somewhat strong he said to hear grumbling in oneself the contrary of what one is thinking but he had need to call to his help all his will he felt that he should yield and spit out all these impurities wherefore he fled thinking that should he find no means of resistance it were better to vomit this filth in the court rather than in the church and so soon as he quitted the chapel this madness of blasphemy ceased he walked along the pond astonished by the strange violence of the attack little by little there came to him the unexplained intuition of a danger that menaced him as a beast that scents a hidden enemy he looked with precaution within himself and ended by seeing a black point on the horizon of his soul and suddenly before he had time to reconnoitre and take account of the danger he saw arising this point extended and covered him with its shadow there was no more light in him he had that minute of unrest which precedes the storm and in the anxious silence of his being arguments fell like drops of rain the painful effects of the sacrament justified themselves had he not proceeded in such a way that his communion could not but be unfaithful evidently instead of collecting and straining himself he had passed an afternoon of revolt and anger the very evening before he had unworthily judged an ecclesiastic whose only wrong was that he took pleasure in the vanity of easy jokes had he confessed this injustice and these revolts not the least in the world and after the communion still less had he as he should have done shut himself up alone with his guest he had abandoned him without thinking more of him had quitted his innermost cell had taken a walk in the wood had not even been present at the offices but come come this blame is foolish i communicated just as i was on the formal order of the confessor as for the walk i did not ask for it nor wish for it m bruneau in agreement with the abbot of la trappe decided it would do me good i have then nothing to reproach myself with i am blameless this does not prove that you would not have done better to spend the day in prayer in the church but he cried with such a system one could not move one could not eat nor sleep for one should never leave the church there must be time for everything or the devil take it all no doubt but a more diligent soul would have refused that excursion just because it was pleasant would have avoided it out of mortification in a spirit of penance evidently but these scruples tortured him the fact is he said i might have employed my afternoon more wholesomely than that to believe that he had spent it ill was but a step and he made it he pelted himself for an hour sweating with agony heaping on himself imaginary sins and entering so far on that road that he ended by suddenly realizing his position and understanding he was out of the right track the story of the rosary returned to his memory and then he blamed himself for allowing himself to be again driven into a corner by the demon he began to breathe again to regain his footing when other attacks equally formidable presented themselves it was no longer an insinuation of arguments which ran drop by drop but a furious rain which threw itself like an avalanche on his soul the storm of which the wave of scruples was only the prelude burst in its fullness and in the panic of the first moment in the violence of the tempest the enemy unmasked his batteries and struck him to the heart he had got no good from that communion but he was also too young at it ah indeed was he to believe that because a priest uttered five latin words over a bit of unleavened bread that bread was transubstantiated into the flesh of christ that a child should accept such nonsense might be possible but that a man past forty should listen to such formidable shams was excessive almost disquieting and these insinuations lashed him like hail showers how could bread made of wheat before have only the appearance of wheat afterwards what is flesh that is neither seen nor felt what is a body which has such ubiquity as to be at the same time on the altars of diverse countries what is that power which is annihilated when the host is not made of pure wheat and this became a regular deluge which overwhelmed him and yet like an impenetrable pile that faith he had acquired without ever having known how remained immovable disappeared under torrents of interrogation but never stirred he revolted and said to himself this only proves that the sacramental darkness of the eucharist cannot be sounded moreover if it were intelligible it would not be divine if the god whom we serve could be comprehended by reason he could not be worth the trouble of serving said Taula. and the imitation declares plainly also at the end of the fourth book that if the works of god were such as man's intelligence could easily grasp they would cease to be marvellous and could not be qualified as ineffable and a mocking voice replied 
that is what you call answering avowing that there is nothing to answer in fact said durtal who reflected i have been present at spiritualistic experiences where no trickery was possible it was quite evident that there was no fluid from the spectators no suggestion of persons surrounding the table who dictated the responses then in giving its raps the table expressed itself suddenly in english though no one spoke that language then a few minutes later addressing itself to me who was at a distance from it and consequently was not touching it it told me this time in french facts which i had forgotten and i alone could know i am then certainly obliged to suppose an element of the supernatural using a table in guise of an interpreter to accept if not the evocation of the dead but at least the proved existence of ghosts then it is not more impossible more surprising that christ should substitute himself for a piece of bread than that a ghost should hide and brag in the foot of a table these phenomena equally put our senses to rout but if one of them be undeniable and spiritualistic manifestation certainly is so what motives can we invoke to deny the other which is moreover attested by thousands of saints after all he went on with a smile we have already demonstration by the absurd but this may be called demonstration by the abject for if the eucharistic mystery is sublime it is not the same with spiritualism which is after all only the latrine of the supernatural if this were the only enigma began the voice again but all the catholic doctrines are on the same model examine religion from its birth and see if it do not always issue by an absurd dogma here is a god infinitely perfect infinitely good a god who is not ignorant of past present or future he knew then that eve would sin therefore of two things one either he is not good in that he submitted her to that proof knowing that she had not power to stand it or again he was not certain of her defeat in that case he is not omniscient he is not perfect durtal gave no answer to this dilemma which is in fact difficult to resolve yet he thought we may at once exclude one of these two propositions the latter for it is childish to concern ourselves about the future when we have to do with god we judge him by our miserable understanding and there is for him neither present nor past nor future he sees them all at the same moment in light uncreate for him distance has no figure and space is naught it is consequently impossible to doubt that the serpent will conquer this amputated dilemma is then out of order be it so but the other alternative remains what do you make of his goodness his goodness and durtal had need to repeat again the arguments drawn from free will and the promised coming of the saviour and he was obliged to admit that these answers were weak and the voice became more pressing then you admit original sin i am obliged to admit it because it exists what are heredity and atavism save under another name the terrible sin of the beginning and does it appear to you just that innocent generations should make amends now and always for the sin of the first man and as durtal did not reply the voice insinuated gently this law is so iniquitous that it seems as if the creator were ashamed of it and that in order to punish himself for his ferocity and not to make himself forever execrated by his creature he wished to suffer on the cross and expiate his crime in the person of his own son but cried durtal exasperated god could not commit a crime and punish himself were that so jesus would be the redeemer of his father and not ours it is madness little by little he recovered his balance he recited slowly the apostles creed while the objections which demolished it pressed one after the other within him there is one fact certain he said to himself for in all this tumult he was perfectly lucid that for the moment we are two persons in one i can follow my reasonings and i hear on the other side the sophisms my double breathes in me this duality has never appeared so clear to me and the attack grew feebler on this reflection it might have been believed that the enemy now discovered was beating a retreat but nothing of the kind after a short truce the assault began again on another point are you very sure that you have not suggested and shown the blow to yourself by having wished you have ended by begetting belief and by implanting in yourself a fixed idea disguised under the name of grace round which everything now clings you complain that you did not experience sensible joys after your communion this simply proves that you were not careful enough 
or that tired by the excess of the evening before your imagination showed itself unready to play the infatuating fairy story you expected from yourself after the mass moreover you ought to know that in these questions all depends on the more or less feverish activity of the brain and the senses see what takes place in the case of women who deceive themselves more easily than men for that again declares the difference of conformations the variety between the sexes christ gives himself carnally under the appearances of bread that is mystical marriage the divine union consummated by the way of the lips he is indeed the spouse of women while we men without willing it by the very lodestone of our nature are more attracted by the virgin but she does not give herself like her son to us she does not reside in the sacrament possession is in her case impossible she is our mother but she is not our spouse as he is the spouse of virgins we conceive therefore that women are more violently duped that they adore better and imagine more easily the more they are petted moreover m bruno said to you yesterday woman is more passive less rebellious to the action of heaven well what has that to do with me what does that prove that the more we love the better we are loved but if that axiom is false from the earthly point of view it is certainly exact from the divine point of view which would be monstrous and would come to this that the lord would not treat the soul of a poor clare better than mine there was again a time of rest and the attack turned and rushed on a new place then you believe in an eternal hell you suppose a god more cruel than yourself a god who has created people without their having been consulted without their having asked to be born and after having suffered during their existence they will be again punished without mercy after their death but consider if you were to see your worst enemy in torture you would be taken by pity and would ask pardon for him you would pardon and the almighty be implacable you will admit this is to have a singular idea of him durtal was silent hell going on infinitely became in fact wearisome the reply that it is legitimate that punishment should be infinite because rewards are so was not decisive since indeed it were the property of perfect goodness to abridge the chastisements and prolong the joys but in fact he said to himself saint catherine of genoa has elucidated the question she explains very well that god sends a ray of mercy a current of pity into hell that no damned soul suffers as much as it deserves to suffer that if expiation ought not to cease it may be modified and weakened and become at length less rigorous less intense she remarks also that at the moment of its separation from the body the soul becomes obstinate or yields if it remain hardened and shows no contrition for its faults its guilt cannot be remitted since after death free will subsists no more the will which we possess at the moment of quitting the world remains invariable if on the contrary it does not persist in those impenitent sentiments a part of the repression will no doubt be removed and consequently is not devoted to a continual gehenna as that which deliberately while there is yet time will not return to amendment refuses in fact to lay aside its sins let us add that according to the saint god does not even make the soul empty to be never polluted by sin for it goes there of itself it is led there by the very nature of its sins it flings itself in as into its own good is if one may say so naturally engulfed there in fact we may imagine to ourselves a very small hell and a very large purgatory may imagine that hell is scantily peopled is only reserved for cases of rare wickedness that in reality the crowd of disincarnate souls presses into purgatory and there endures punishments proportioned to the misdeeds it has willed here below these ideas have nothing which cannot be sustained and they have the advantage of being in accord with the ideas of mercy and justice exactly replied the voice in railing tones man then will do well to constrain himself he may steal rob kill his father and violate his daughter the price is the same provided he repent at the last minute he is saved but no contrition takes away the eternity of punishment only and not punishment itself every one must be punished or rewarded according to his works he who will be soiled by a parricide or an incest will bear a chastisement different in pain and length to him who has not committed them equality in expiatory suffering in reparative pain does not exist moreover this idea of a purgative life after death is so natural so certain that all religions assume it all consider the soul is a sort of air balloon which cannot mount and attain its last end in space except by throwing away its ballast in the religions of the east the soul is reincarnistic 
in order to purify itself it rubs itself against a new body like a blade in sandstone troughs to brighten it for us catholics it undergoes no terrestrial avatar but it lightens and scours itself clears itself in the purgatory where god transforms it draws it out extracts it little by little from the dross of its sins till it can raise itself and lose itself in him to have done with this irritating question of a perpetual hell why not conceive that divine justice hesitates in the majority of cases to pronounce inexorable decrees humanity is for the most part composed of unconscious rascals and fools who do not take any count on the reach of their faults these are saved by their complete want of comprehension as for others who rot knowing what they do they are evidently more blameworthy but society which hates superior beings takes on itself their punishment humiliates and persecutes them and it is therefore allowed us to hope that our lord will pity these poor souls so miserably pelted during their stay upon earth by a horde of fools then there is every advantage in being imbecile since one is spared both on earth and in heaven ah certainly and yet and yet what is the good of discussion since we cannot frame for ourselves the least idea of the infinite justice of a god moreover this is enough these debates overwhelm me he tried to distract his thoughts from these subjects and would fain to break the obsession betake himself to paris but five minutes had not passed before his double returned to the charge he entered once more on that halting dilemma which had so recently assailed the goodness of the creator in regard to the sins of man purgatory is then exorbitant for after all said he god knew that man would yield to temptations then why allow them and above all why condemn them is that goodness is that justice but it is a sophism cried durtal growing angry god has left to every man his liberty no one is tempted beyond his power if in certain cases he allows the seduction to overpass our means of resistance it is to recall us to humility to bring us back to him by remorse for other causes which we know not which it is not his business to show us then probably those transgressions are appreciated in a different way to those which we have practised with our full accord the liberty of man it is a pretty thing yes let us speak of it and atavism and our surroundings and diseases of the brain and of the marrow is a man driven by the impulses of sickness overwhelmed by troubles of the generative organs responsible for his acts but what can be said if under these conditions these acts are imputed to him on high it is after all idiotic always to compare divine justice to man's tribunals for it is exactly the contrary human judgments are often so infamous that they attest the existence of another equity rather than the proofs of a theodicy the magistrature proves god for without him how can be satisfied that instinct of justice so innate in each of us that even the humblest beast possesses it yet replied the voice all this does not hinder the change of character according as the stomach does its work ill or well slander anger envy or accumulated bile or faulty digestion good temper joy come from a free circulation of blood the expansion of the body at will mystics are a nemo nervous people your ecstatics are hysterical patients badly fed madhouses are full of them they depend on science when visions begin all at once durtal recovered himself the material arguments were but little disquieting for none could remain standing all confounded the function and the organ the lodger and the lodging the clock and the hour their assertions rested on no base to liken the happy lucidity and unequalled genius of a saint teresa to the extravagances of nymphomaniacs and other mad women were so obtuse so clumsy that it could only raise a smile the mystery would remain complete no doctor has been able to discover or could discover the psyche in those round or fusiform cells in the white matter or grey substance of the brain they would recognize more or less justly the organs which the soul uses to pull the strings of the puppet which it is condemned to move but itself remains invisible it has gone when after death they force open the rooms of its habitation no these newsmongers have no effect on me durtal assured himself but does this one do any better do you believe in the utility of life in the necessity of this endless chain this towage of sufferings to be prolonged for the most part after death true goodness would have consisted in inventing nothing creating nothing in leaving all as it was in nothingness in peace 
the attack turned round on itself and after apparent variations returned always to the same starting point durtal lowered his head for this argument dismastered him all the replies which could be imagined were remarkably weak and the least feeble that which consists in denying to ourselves the right to judge because we only see the details of the divine plan because we can possess no general view of it cannot avail against that terrible phrase of schopenhauer if god made the world i would not be that god for the misery of the world would break my heart there is no haggling in the matter he said to himself i can quite understand that sorrow is the true disinfectant of souls yet i am obliged to ask myself why the creator has not invented a less atrocious way of purifying us ah when i think of the sufferings shut up in madhouses and hospital wards i am revolted and inclined to doubt everything if again grief were an antiseptic for future misdeeds or a detersive for past faults one might again understand but now it falls indifferently on the bad and on the good it is blind the best proof is the virgin who was without spot and who had not like her son to expiate for us she consequently ought not to be punished yet she too underwent at the foot of calvary the punishment exacted by this horrible law good but then replied durtal after a silence of reflection if the innocent virgin has given us an example by what right do we who are culpable dare to complain no we must therefore resolve to dwell in darkness to live surrounded by enigmas money love nothing is clear chance if it exists is as mysterious as providence and indeed still more so it is inexplicable god is at least an origin of the unknown a key an origin which is itself another secret a key which opens nothing ah oh, it is irritating he said to himself to be thus harassed in every sense enough of it besides these are questions which a theologian is alone able to discuss i am unarmed the game is not equal i will not answer any more and he could not but hear a vague laughter which arose in him he quitted the garden and directed his steps towards the chapel but the fear of being seized again by the madness of blasphemy turned him away from it knowing not whither to go he regained his cell saying to himself that he ought not to wrangle thus yes but how could he help hearing the cavils which rose he knew not whence he almost shouted aloud be silent let the other speak when he was in his chamber he desired to pray and fell on his knees at his bedside this was abominable for memories of florence recurred to him he rose but the old aberrations returned he thought of that creature her strange tastes her mania for biting his ears for drinking toilet scents in little glasses for nibbling bread and butter with caviar and dates she was so wild and so strange a fool no doubt but obscure and if she were in this room before you what would you do he stammered to himself i would try not to yield you lie admit then that you would send your conversion the monastery all to the devil he grew pale at the thought the possibility of his cowardice was a punishment to have communicated when one was no more certain of the future no more certain of oneself was almost a sacrilege he thought and he became angry up till now he had kept right but the vision of florence subdued him he threw himself in desperation on a chair no longer knowing what would become of him gathering what of courage remained to him to descend to the church where the office was beginning he dragged himself there and held himself down assailed by filthy temptations disgusted with himself feeling his will yielding wounded in every part and when he was in the court he remained overwhelmed asking himself where he could take shelter every place had become hostile to him in his cell were carnal memories outside were temptations against faith or rather he cried i carry these with me always my god my god I was yesterday so tranquil he strolled by chance into an alley when a new phenomenon arose he had had up to this hour in the sky within him a rain of scruples a tempest of doubts a thunderstroke of lust now was silence and death complete darkness was within him he sought his soul by groping for it and found it inert without consciousness almost icy he had a body living and healthy all his intelligence all his reason and his other powers his other faculties were benumbed little by little and stopped 
in his being there was manifested an effect at once analogous and contrary to that which curara produces on the organism when it circulates in the network of the blood the members are paralyzed no pain is experienced but cold rises the soul ends by being sequestered alive in a corpse in this case it was the living body that detained a dead soul harassed by fear he disengaged himself with a supreme effort he would make a visit to himself see where he was and like a sailor who descends into the hold in a ship that has sprung a leak he had to step backwards for the gangway was cut the steps opened upon an abyss in spite of the terror which rushed upon him he hung fascinated over the hole and by fixing the black point he distinguished appearances in a light as of eclipse in rarefied air he perceived at the basis of himself the panorama of his soul a desert twilight on the horizons that approached the night and under this doubtful light there seemed something like bare fields a marsh heaped with rubbish and cinders the place of the sins torn up by the confessor remained visible but besides the dry charnel of dead vices which grew still nothing budded he saw himself exhausted he knew that he had no further force to extirpate the last roots and he fancied that he had again to sow the seed of virtues to till this arid soil manure this dead ground he felt himself incapable of all work and had at the same time the conviction that god rejected him that god would aid him no more this certainty tore him to pieces it could not be expressed for nothing could translate the anxiety the anguish of a state through which he must have passed who could understand it the terror of a child who has never left its mother's petticoats and who is deserted without warning in the open country in a fog could only give a vestige of an idea of it and again by reason of his age the child after having felt desolate would end by growing calmer by distracting himself from his grief no longer seeing the danger which surrounds him while in this state is danger clinging and absolute the immovable thought of abandonment obstinate fear which nothing diminishes nothing appeases one dare not advance nor retreat rather cast oneself on the ground with bowed head and wait the end of what we know not and be assured that the menaces we ignore and those at which we guess are removed durtal was at this point he could not return on his steps for the way he had quitted horrified him he would rather have died than return to paris there to begin again his carnal experiences to live again his libertinage and lassitude but if he could not again retrace his road neither could he advance for the road ended in a blind alley if the earth repulsed him heaven at the same time was closed for him he was lying half on his side in the darkness in the shade he knew not where and this state was aggravated by an absolute failure to understand the causes which brought him there was exaggerated by the memory of graces before received durtal remembered the sweetness of the beginning the caress of the divine touches the steady progress without obstacles the encounter with a solitary priest his being sent to la trappe the very ease with which he bent to the monastic life the absolution which had such truly sensible effects the rapid and clear answer that he might communicate without fear and suddenly without his will he had in fact failed he who had till then held him by the hand refused to guide him cast him off into the darkness without a word all is over he thought i am condemned to float here below like a waif which no one wants no shore is henceforward accessible for if the world refuses me i disgust god ah lord remember the garden of gethsemane the tragic defection of the father whom thou didst implore in unspeakable pangs in the silence which received his cry he gave way and yet he desired to react against this desolation endeavoured to escape from his despair he prayed and had again that very precise sensation that his petitions did not carry were not even heard he called her who superintends allegiance the mediatrix of pardon to his aid and he was persuaded that the virgin heard him no longer he was silent and discouraged while the shade grew still more dense and complete darkness covered him he did not then suffer any longer in the true sense of the word but it was worse for this was annihilation in the void the giddiness of a man who is bent over a gulf and the scraps of reasoning which he could gather and knit together in this breaking up ended by branching out into scruples he sought for any sins which since his communion might justify such a trial and he could not find them he even tried to magnify his small faults enlarge his want of patience 
he wished to convince himself that he had taken a certain pleasure in finding the image of florence in his cell and he tortured himself so violently that he reanimated the soul which had half fainted by these moxas and placed it again without wishing it in that acute state of scruples in which it was when the crisis declared itself and in these brawling reflections he did not lose the sad faculty of analysis he said to himself while gauging himself at a glance i am like the litter in a circus trodden down by all the sorrows which go and come to play their parts doubts about faith which seem to stretch into every sense turned in fact in the same circle and now scruples from which i thought myself freed reappear and course through me how should he explain this was he who inflicted this torture on him the spirit of malice or god that he had been bruised by the evil one was certain the very nature of his attacks showed his handiwork but how could this abandonment of god be explained for in fact the demon could not prevent the saviour from assisting him and he was quite obliged to conclude that if he were martyrized by the one the other took no interest in him let him be and retired from him completely this certainty deduced from precise observations this reasoned assurance finished him he cried out from the anguish of it looking at the pond by which he was walking wishing he might fall in thinking that death by drowning were preferable to such a life then he trembled before the water which attracted him and carried away his sorrows to the charm of the woods he tried to wear himself out by long walking but he wearied himself without effect and he ended by sinking down worn and broken at the refectory table he looked at his plate with no courage to eat no desire to drink he breathed hard and exhausted as he was could not keep in one place he rose and wandered in the court till compline and there in the chapel where at least he hoped to find some solace was the crowning point of all the mine went off the soul sapped since the morning exploded on his knees desolate he tried again to invoke help and nothing came he choked immured in so deep a trench under a vault so thick that every appeal was stifled and no sound vibrated without courage he wept with his head in his hands and while he complained to god that he had brought him thither to punish him in a trappist monastery ignoble visions assailed him fluids passed before his face and peopled the space with priapisms he did not see them with the eyes of his body which were in no degree hallucinated but perceived them outside him and felt them within him in a word the touch was external and the vision internal he tried to gaze on the statue of st joseph before which he kept himself and to see nothing of it but his eyes seemed to revolve to see only within and were filled with indecencies it was a medley of apparitions with undecided outlines and confused colours which gained precision only in those parts coveted by the secular infamy of man and this changed again the human forms vanished there remained only in invisible landscapes of flesh marshes reddened by the fires of what sunset it was impossible to say marshes shuddering under the divided shelter of the grasses then the sensual spot grew smaller still but remained and this time did not move it was the growth of an unclean flood the spreading of the daisy of darkness the unfolding of the lotus of the caverns hidden at the bottom of the valley and there burning gasps excited durtal enwrapped him stifled him with furious gasps which drank his mouth he looked in spite of himself unable to withdraw himself from the outrages imposed by these violations but the body was still and remained calm while the soul revolted with a groan the temptation was then of no effect but if the tricks only succeeded in suggesting to him disgust and horror they made him suffer beyond measure while they delayed all the days of his shameful existence came to the surface all these enticements to greedy desires crucified him joined to the sum of sorrows accumulated since the dawn the overcharge of these sorrows overwhelmed him and a cold sweat bathed him from head to foot he was in agony and suddenly as though he had come to overlook his ministers and to see if his orders were carried out the executioner himself entered on the scene durtal did not see him but felt him and it was indescribable since he had the impression of a real demoniac presence his whole soul trembled and desired to fly like a terrified bird that clings to the window panes and it fell back exhausted then unlikely as it may appear the parts of his life were inverted the body was upright and held its own 
commanding the terrified soul repressed this panic in a furious tension durtal perceived very plainly and clearly for the first time the distinction the separation of the soul from the body and for the first time also he was conscious of the phenomenon of a body which had so tortured its companion by its needs and wants to forget all its hatred in the common danger and hinder her who resisted it the habit of sinking he saw that in a flash and suddenly all vanished it seemed that the demon had taken himself off the wall of darkness which encompassed durtal opened and light issued from all parts with an immense impulse the salve regina springing up from the choir swept aside the phantoms and put the goblins to flight the elevated cordial of this chant restored him he took courage and began again to hope that this frightful desertion might cease he prayed and his petitions found vent he understood that they were at last heard the office was at an end he gained the guest-house and when he appeared so worn out and pale before father Essien and the oblate they cried what is the matter with you he sank on a chair and endeavoured to describe to them the terrible calvary he had climbed this has lasted he said for more than nine hours i wonder that i have not gone mad and he added yet i never could have believed that the soul could suffer so much the face of the father was illuminated he pressed durtal's hands and said rejoice my brother you have been treated here like a monk how is that said durtal surprised yes this agony for there is no other word to define the horror of the state is one of the most serious trials which god inflicts on us it is one of the operations of the purgative life be happy for it is a great grace which jesus does to you and this proves that your conversion is good affirmed the oblate god but it was not he at any rate who insinuated doubts about the faith who caused to be born in me that madness of scruples who raised in me that spirit of blasphemy who caressed my face with disgusting apparitions no but he allows it it is frightful i know it said the guest master god conceals himself and however you may call on him he does not answer you you think yourself deserted yet he is very near you and while he effaces himself satan advances he twists you about places a microscope over your faults his malice gnaws your brain like a dull file and when to all this are joined to try you to the utmost impure visions the trappist stopped then speaking to himself he said slowly it would be nothing to be in presence of a real temptation of a true woman in flesh and bone but these appearances on which imagination works are horrible and i used to think there was peace in the cloister no we are here on this earth to strive and it is just in the cloister that the lowest works there souls escape him and he will at all price conquer them no place on earth is more haunted by him than a cell no one is more harassed than a monk a story which is told in the lives of the fathers in the desert is typical from this point of view one demon only was charged to watch a town and he went to sleep while two or three hundred demons who had orders to guard a monastery had no rest but behaved themselves here is the place for the phrase like very devils and indeed the mission to increase the sin of the towns is a sinecure for satan holds them though they are not aware of it all then he has to do is to torment them so as to take from them trust in god since all obey him without his taking the least trouble about it and so he keeps his legions to besiege convents where resistance is determined and indeed you see the way in which he conducts the attack ah oh, exclaimed durtal it is not he who makes you suffer the most for what is worse than scruples worse than temptations against purity or against the faith is the supposed abandonment of heaven no nothing can describe that that is what mystical theology calls the night obscure answered m bruno and durtal exclaimed ah oh, now i am with you i remember that is why st john of the cross declares that it is impossible to describe the sorrows of that night and why he exaggerates nothing when he says that one is then plunged alive into hell and i doubted the veracity of his books i accused him of excess rather he minimized only one must have felt this oneself to believe it and you have seen nothing the oblate replied quietly you have passed through the first portion of that night through the night of the senses 
it is terrible enough as i know by experience but it is nothing in comparison with the night of the spirit which sometimes succeeds it that is the exact image of the sufferings which our lord endured in the garden of olives when sweating blood he cried at the end of his force lord let this chalice pass from me this is so terrible and monsieur bruno was silent and grew pale whoever has undergone that martyrdom he said after a pause knows beforehand what awaits the damned in another life but said the monk the hour of bedtime has struck there exists but one remedy for all these evils the holy eucharist to-morrow sunday the community approaches the sacrament you must join us but i cannot communicate in the state in which i am well then be up to-night at three o'clock i will come for you to your cell and will take you to father maximin who confesses us at that time and without waiting for his answer the guest master pressed his hand and went he is right said the oblate it is the true remedy and when he had regained his room durtal thought i now understand why the abbe gevresin made such a point of lending me st john of the cross he knew that i should enter into the night obscure he did not dare warn me clearly for fear of alarming me and yet he would put me on my guard against despair and aid me by the remembrance here of that reading only how could he think that in such a shipwreck i should remember anything all this makes me think that i have omitted to write to him and that to-morrow i must keep my promise by sending him a letter and he thought again of st john of the cross that extraordinary carmelite who described so placidly that terrible phase of the mystic genesis he took count of the lucidity the power of spirit of this saint explaining the most obscure vicissitude of the soul and the least known catching and following the operations of god who dealt with that soul pressed it in his hands squeezed it like a sponge then let it suck up again fill itself with sorrows then wrung it again making it drip tears of blood to cleanse it end of part two chapter five part two chapter six of en route by jory karl heismans translated by charles keegan paul this librivox recording is in the public domain no said durtal in a whisper i will not take the place of these good people but i assure you it is quite the same to them and while durtal was still refusing to go before the lay brothers who were waiting their turn for confession father etienne insisted i will stay with you and as soon as the cell is free you will enter durtal was then on the landing of a staircase on every step of which was posted a brother kneeling or standing his head wrapped in his hood his face turned to the wall all were sifting and closely examining their souls of what sins can they really accuse themselves thought durtal who knows he continued perceiving brother anacletus his head sunk on his breast and his hands joined who knows if he does not reproach himself for the discreet affection he has for me for in monasteries all friendship is forbidden and he called to memory in the way of perfection of saint teresa a page at once glowing and icy in which she cries out on the nothingness of human ties declares that friendship is a weakness and asserts clearly that every nun who desires to see her relations is imperfect come said father etienne who interrupted these reflections and pushed him towards the door of the cell out of which a monk came father maximin was there seated close to prie dieu durtal knelt and told him briefly his scruples and strifes of the evening before what has happened to you is not surprising after a conversion indeed it is a good sign for those persons alone for whom god has views are submitted to these proofs said the monk slowly when durtal had ended his story and he continued now that you have no more grave sins the demon endeavours to drown you by spitting at you in fact in these episodes of malice at bay there is for you temptation and no sin you have if i may sum up what you have said undergone temptation of the flesh and of faith and you have been tortured by scruples let us leave on one side the sensual visions such as they have been were produced independently of your will painful no doubt but ineffectual doubts about faith are more dangerous steep yourself in this truth that besides prayer there exists but one efficacious remedy against this evil to despise it 
satan is pride despise him and at once his audacity gives way he speaks shrug your shoulders and he is silent you must not discuss with him however good a reasoner you may be you will be worsted for he is a most tricky dialectician yes but what can i do i do not wish to listen to him but i hear him all the same i was obliged to answer him if only to refute him and it was just on that that he counted to subdue you keep this carefully in your mind in order to let you give him an easy throw he will present you at need grotesque arguments and so soon as he sees you confident simply satisfied with the excellence of your replies he will involve you in sophisms so specious that you will fight in vain to solve them no i repeat to you had you the best reasons to oppose to him do not repost refuse the strife the prior was silent then he began again quietly there are two ways of getting rid of a thing which troubles you to throw it far away or let it fall to throw it to a distance demands an effort of which one may not be capable to let it fall imposes no fatigue is simple without danger within the reach of all to throw to a distance implies again a certain interest a certain animation perhaps even a certain fear to let it fall is indifference complete contempt believe me use this means and satan will fly this weapon of contempt will also be all-powerful to conquer the assault of scruples if in combats of this nature the person assailed sees clear unfortunately the peculiarity of scruples is to alarm people to make them lose at once the clearing breeze and then it is indispensable to have recourse to a priest to defend oneself indeed pursued the monk who had interrupted himself a moment to think the closer one looks the less one sees one becomes short-sighted the moment one observes it is necessary to place oneself at a certain point of view to distinguish objects for when they are very close they become as confused as if they were far therefore in such a case we must have recourse to the confessor who is neither too distant nor too near who holds himself precisely at the spot where objects detach themselves in their relief only it is with scruples as with certain maladies which when they are not taken in time become almost incurable do not allow them then to become implanted in you scruple cannot resist being told as soon as it begins the moment you formulate it before the priest it dissolves it is a kind of mirage which a word effaces you will object to me continued the monk after a silence that it is very mortifying to avow delusions which generally are absurd but it is for this very reason that the demon suggests to you less clever arguments than foolish he takes hold of you thus by vanity by false shame the monk was silent again then he continued scruples not treated scruples not cured lead to discouragement which is the worst of temptations for in other cases satan attacks one virtue only in particular and he shows himself while in this case he attacks all at once and he hides himself and this is so true that if you are seduced by lust by the love of money or by pride you can in examining yourself give yourself account of the nature of the temptation which exhausts you in discouragement on the contrary your understanding is obscured to such a degree that you do not even suspect that the state in which you succumb is only a diabolic manoeuvre which you must combat and you let go all you give up the only arm which can save you prayer from which the demon turns you aside as a vain thing never hesitate then to cut the evil at its root to take care of a scruple as soon as it is born now tell me you have nothing else to confess no except the indesire for the eucharist the languor in which i now faint there is some fatigue in your case for no one can endure such a shock with impunity do not be uneasy about that have confidence do not attempt to present yourself before god all neat and trim go to him simply naturally in undress even just as you are do not forget that if you are a servant you are also a son have good courage our lord will dispel all these nightmares and when he had received absolution durtal went down to the church to await the hour of mass and when the moment for communion came he followed m bruno behind the lay brothers all were kneeling on the pavement and one after the other rose to exchange the kiss of peace and reach the altar though he repeated to himself the counsels of father maximin though he exhorted himself to dismiss all his unrest durtal could not help thinking as he saw these monks approach the table the lord will find a change when i advance in my turn having descended into the sanctuaries he will be reduced to visit hovel
and sincerely humbly he was sorry for him and as the first time that he approached this peace-giving mystery he experienced a sensation of stifling as if his heart were too large when he returned to his place as soon as the mass was over he quitted the chapel and escaped into the park then gently without sensible effects the sacrament worked christ opened little by little his closed house and gave it air light entered into durtal in a flood from the windows of his senses which had looked till then into he knew not what cesspool into what enclosure dank and steeped in shadow he now looked suddenly through a burst of light on a vista which lost itself in heaven his vision of nature was modified the surroundings were transformed the fog of sadness which visited them vanished the sudden clearness of his soul was repeated in its surroundings he had the sensation of expansion the almost childlike joy of a sick man who takes his first outing of the convalescent who having long crawled in a chamber sets foot without all grew young again these alleys this wood through which he had wandered so much which he began to know in all their windings and in every corner began to appear to him in a new aspect a restrained joy a repressed gladness emanated from this sight which appeared to him instead of extending as formerly to draw near and gather round the crucifix to turn as it were with attention towards the liquid cross the trees rustled trembling in a whisper of prayers inclining towards the christ who no longer twisted his painful arms in the mirror of the pool but he constrained these waters and displayed them before him blessing them they were themselves different the dark fluid was covered with monastic visions in white robes which the reflections of clouds left there in passing and the swan scattered them in a splash of sunlight making as he swam great oily circles round him one might have said that these waves were gilt by the oil of the catechumens and the sacred chrism which the church exorcises on the saturday of holy week and above them heaven half opened its tabernacle of clouds out of which came a clear sun like a monstrance of molten gold in a blessed sacrament of flames it was a benediction of nature a genuflection of trees and flowers singing in the wind incensing with their perfume the sacred bread which shone on high in the flaming custody of the planet durtal looked on in transport he desired to cry aloud his enthusiasm and his faith to the landscape he felt a joy in living the horror of existence counted for nothing when there were such moments as no earthly happiness can give god alone had the power of thus filling a soul of making it overflow and rush in floods of joy and he alone could also fill the basin of sorrows as no event in this world could do durtal had just tried it his spiritual sufferings and joys attained under the divine imprint an acuteness which people most humanly happy or unhappy cannot even suspect this idea brought him back to the terrible distresses of the evening before he endeavoured to sum up what he had been able to observe of himself in this trappist monastery first the clear distinction between body and soul then the action of the demon insinuating and obstinate almost visible while the heavenly action remained on the contrary dull and veiled appeared only at certain moments and seemed at others to vanish for ever and all this when felt and understood had an appearance simple in itself but scarcely explaining itself the body appearing to throw itself forward to the rescue of the soul and no doubt borrowing from it its will to help it when it fainted was unintelligible how a body could itself react obscurely and yet show all at once so strong a decision that it pressed its companion into a vice and prevented its flight it is as mysterious as the rest thought durtal and as in a dream he continued the secret action of jesus in his sacrament is not less strange if i may judge by what has happened to me a first communion exasperates the action of the devil while a second represses it ah and how i put myself in line with all my calculations in taking shelter here i thought myself pretty sure of my soul and that my body would trouble me whereas just the contrary has been the case my stomach has grown vigorous and shown itself fit to support an effort of which i should never have thought it capable and my soul has been below everything vacillating and dry so fragile so feeble but we will let all that alone he walked about lifted from earth by a confused joy he grew vaporized in a sort of intoxication in a vague etherization in which arose without his even thinking of formulating words acts of thanksgiving 
it was an effort of thanks of his soul of his body of his whole being to that god whom he felt living in him and diffused in that kneeling landscape which also seemed to expand in mute hymns of gratitude the hour which struck by the clock in the portico reminded him it was breakfast time he went to the guest-house cut himself a slice of bread and butter with some cheese drank half a glass of wine and was about to go out again when he reflected that the horary of the officers was changed they must be different from those of the week he thought and he went up into his cell to consult his placards he found only one that of the rule of the monks themselves which contained the regulations for the sunday practices for the cloister and he read exercises of the community for all ordinary sundays morning one rise little office prayer till one thirty two grand canonical office chanted five thirty prime morning mass six o'clock six forty five chapter instructions great silence nine fifteen asperges tierce procession ten high mass eleven ten sext and special examination eleven thirty angelus dinner twelve fifteen siesta great silence evening two end of repose none four vespers and benediction five forty five quarter of an hour for prayer six supper seven reading before compline seven fifteen compline seven thirty salve angelus seven forty five examination of conscience and retreat eight bedtime great silence note after the cross of september no siesta none is at two o'clock vespers at three supper at five compline at six and bedtime at seven durtal copied this rule for his use on a scrap of paper in fact he said to himself i have to be in chapel at nine fifteen for asperges high mass and the office of sext afterwards at two for none then at four for vespers and benediction and lastly at seven thirty for compline here is a day which will be occupied without counting that i got up at half past two this morning he concluded and when he reached the chapel about nine o'clock he found the greater part of the lay brothers on their knees the others saying their rosary and when the clock struck all returned to their place assisted by two fathers in cowls the prior vested in a white alb entered and while the antiphon asperges me domine hisopo et mundabor was sung all the monks in succession defiled before father maximin standing on the steps turning his back to the altar and he sprinkled them with holy water while they regained their stalls each making the sign of the cross then the prior descended from the altar and came to the entrance to the vestibule where he dispersed the water crosswise traced by the sprinkler over the oblate and over durtal at last he vested and went to celebrate the sacrifice then durtal was able to think over his sundays at the benedictine nuns the Kyrie eleison was the same but slower and more sonorous more grave on the prolonged termination of the last word at paris the voices of the nuns drew it out and put a gloss on it at the same time turned into satin its final sound rendered it less dull less spaced less ample the gloria in excelsis differed that of la trappe was more primitive more mounting more sombre interesting by its very barbarism but less touching for in its forms of adoration in the adoramus te for example the te did not detach itself did not drop like a tear of amorous essence like an avowal retained by humility on the tip of the lips but it was when the credo arose that durtal could uplift himself at ease he had never yet heard it so authoritative and so imposing it advanced chanted in unison developing its slow procession of dogmas in sounds well furnished and rigid of a violet almost obscure a red almost black growing lighter towards the end till it expired in a long and plaintive amen in following the cistercian office durtal could recognize the morsels of plain chant still preserved in parish masses all the part of the canon the sursum corda the vere dignum the antiphons the pater remained intact only the sanctus and the agnus dei were changed massive built up as it were in the roman style they draped themselves in the colour glowing and dull which clothes in fact the officers of la trappe well said the oblate when after the ceremony they sat at the table of the refectory well what do you think of our high mass it is superb answered durtal and he said dreamily would that one would have the whole complete 
to bring here instead of this uninteresting chapel the apse of saint severin hang on the walls the pictures of fra angelico memling grunewald gerard david roger van der weyden boots add to these admirable sculptures such as those of the great door of chartres altar screens of sculptured wood such as those of the cathedral of amiens what a dream yet he went on after a silence this dream has been a reality it is evident this ideal church existed for ages everywhere in the middle ages the chant the goldsmith's work the panels the sculptures the tissues were all attractive the liturgies possessed to give them value fabulous caskets but all that is far off but you certainly cannot say replied m bruno with a smile that the church ornaments are ugly here no they are exquisite first the chasubles have not the shapes of a miner's apron and they do not hoist themselves up on the shoulders of the priest that excrescence that puffing like the ear of a little donkey lying back which the vestment makers use at paris nor is it any more that cross in stripe or woven filling all the stuff falling like a sack coat over the back of the celebrant the trappist chasubles have kept the old form as the old image makers and the old painters preserved them in their religious scenes and that cross with four leaves like those which the gothic style chiselled on the walls of its churches is related to the very expanded lotus a flower so full-blown that its falling petals droop without counting pursued durtal that the stuff which seems cut in a sort of flannel or thick soft felt must have been plunged in threefold dyes for it takes a depth and a magnificent clearness of tone the religious trimming makers could trim these watered and plain silks with silver and gold yet never attain to give a colour at once so vehement and so familiar to the eye as that crimson with sulphur yellow flowers which father maximin wore the other day yes and the morning chasuble with its lobed crosses and its discreet white fullings in which the father abbot vested himself the day on which he communicated us is it not also a caress for the eyes durtal sighed ah if the statues in the chapel showed a like taste by the way said the oblate come and salute that notre dame de latre of which i have spoken to you found among the remains of the old cloister they rose from table passed along a corridor and struck into a lateral gallery at the end of which they stopped before a statue of life-size in stone it was heavy and massive representing in a robe of long folds a peasant woman crowned and round-cheeked holding on her arm a child who blessed a ball but in this portrait of a robust peasant woman sprung from burgundy or flanders there was a candour a goodness almost tumultuous which sprang from her smiling face her innocent eyes her good and large lips indulgent ready for all forgiveness she was a rustic virgin made for the humble lay brothers she was not a great lady who could hold them at a distance but she was indeed the nursing mother of their souls their true mother how was it they had not understood her here how instead of presiding in the chapel did she grow chill at the end of a corridor cried durtal the oblate turned the conversation i warn you he said that benediction will not take place after vespers as your placard indicates but directly after compline this latter office will therefore be advanced a quarter of an hour at least and the oblate went up into his cell while durtal went towards the large pond there he lay down on a bed of dry reed looking at the water which broke in wavelets at his feet the coming and going of these limited waters folding back on themselves yet never overpassing the basin they had hollowed for themselves led him on into long reveries he said to himself that a river was the most exact symbol of the active life one follows it from its source through all its courses across the territories it fertilizes it has fulfilled its assigned task before it dies immersing itself in the gaping sepulchre of the seas but the pond that tamed water imprisoned in a hedge of reeds which it has itself caused to grow in fertilizing the soil of its bank has concentrated itself lived on itself not seemed to achieve any known work save to keep silence and reflect on the infinite of heaven still water troubles me continued durtal it seems to me that unable to extend itself it grows deeper and that while running waters borrow only the shadows of things they reflect it swallows them without giving them back most certainly in this pond is a continued and profound absorption of forgotten clouds of lost trees even of sensations seized on the faces of monks who hung over it this water is full and not empty like those which are distracted in wandering about the country and in bathing the towns it is a contemplative water in perfect accord with the recollected life of the cloisters 
the fact is he concluded that a river would have here no meaning it would only be passing would remain indifferent and in a hurry would be in all cases unfit to pacify the soul which the monastic water of the ponds appeases ah in founding notre dame de l'atre saint bernard knew how to fit the cistercian rule and the site but we must leave these fancies he said rising and remembering that it was sunday he transferred himself to paris and revisited in thought his halts on his day in the churches in the morning saint severin enchanted him but he ought not to thrust himself into that sanctuary for the other officers vespers there were botched and mean and if it were a feast day the organ-master showed himself possessed by the love of ignoble music occasionally durtal had taken refuge at saint gervais where at least they played at certain times motets of the old masters but that church was as well as saint eustache a paying concert where faith had nothing to do no recollection was possible in the midst of ladies who fainted behind their faces in their hands and grew agitated in creaking chairs these were frivolous assemblies for pious music a compromise between the theatre and god saint sulpice was better where at least the public was silent there moreover vespers were celebrated with more solemnity and less haste in general the seminary reinforced the choir and rendered by this imposing choir they rolled on majestically sustained by the grand organ chanted only in half and not in unison reduced to a state of couplets given some by a baritone others by the choir they were twisted and frizzled by a curling iron but as they were not less adulterated at the other churches there was every advantage in listening to them at saint sulpice whose powerful choir very well led had not as for example at notre dame those dusty voices which break at the least whisper this only became really odious when with a formidable explosion the first strophe of the magnificat struck the arches the organ then swallowed up one stanza out of two and under the seditious pretext that the length of the office of incensing was too long to be filled up entirely by singing m vidor seated at his desk rolled forth stale fragments of music splashed about above imitating the human voice and the flute the bagpipe and the bassoon or indeed tired of affectations he blew furiously on the keys ending by imitating the roll of locomotives over iron bridges letting all the stops go and the choir-master not wishing to show himself inferior to the organist in his instinctive hatred of plain chant was delighted when the benediction began to put aside gregorian melodies and make his choristers gurgle rigadoons it was no longer a sanctuary but a howling place the ave maria the ave verum all the mystical indecencies of the late guno the rhapsodies of old thomas the capers of indigent music-casters defiled in a chain wound by choir-leaders from lamoureux chanted unfortunately by children the chastity of whose voices no one feared to pollute in these middle-class passages of music these byways of art ah thought durtal if only this choir-master who is evidently an excellent musician for indeed when he must he knows how to get executed better than anywhere else in paris the de profundis with organ accompaniment and the dies irae if only this man would as at saint gervais give us some palestrina and vittoria some eichinger and allegri some orlando lasso and de pre but no he must detest these masters also consider them as archaic rubbish good to send into the dust heaps and durtal continued what we hear now at paris in the churches is wholly incredible under pretence of managing an income for the singers they suppress half the stanzas of canticles and hymns and substitute to vary the pleasure the tiresome divagations of an organ there they howl the tantum ergo to the austrian national air or what is still worse muffle it up with operatic choruses or refrains from canteens the very text is divided into couplets which are ornamented like a drinking song with a little burthen the other church sequences are treated in the same manner and yet the papacy has formally forbidden in many bulls that the sanctuary should be soiled by those liberties to cite one only john twenty two in his extravagant doctor sanctorum expressly forbade profane voices and music in churches he prohibited choirs at the same time to change plain chant into fioritori the decrees of the council of trent are not less clear from this point of view and more recently still a regulation of the sacred congregation of rites has intervened to proscribe musical rioting in holy places then what are the parish priests doing who in fact have musical police charge in their churches nothing they laugh at it 
nor is this a mere phrase but with those priests who hoping for receipts permit on fete days the shameless voices of actresses to dance gambols to the heavy sounds of the organ the poor church has become far from clean at saint sulpice durtal went on the priest tolerates the villainy of jolly songs which are served up to him but at least he does not like the one at saint severin allow strolling women players to lighten up the office by the shouts of such voices as remain to them nor has he accepted the solo on the english horn which i heard at saint thomas one evening during the perpetual adoration in short if the grand benedictions at saint sulpice are a shame the complines remain in spite of their theatrical attitude really charming and durtal thought of those complines of which the paternity is often attributed to saint benedict they were in fact the integral prayer of the evenings the preventive adjuration the safeguard against the attempts of the demon they were in some measure the advanced sentinels of the outposts placed round the soul to protect it during the night and the regulation of this entrenched camp of prayer was perfect after the benediction the best trained voice the most thread-like of the choir the voice of the smallest of the children sang forth the short lesson taken from the first epistle of st peter warning the faithful that they must be sober and watch not allow themselves to be surprised unexpectedly a priest then recited the usual evening prayers the choir organ gave the intonation and the psalms fell chanted one by one the twilight psalms in which before the approaches of night peopled with goblins and furrowed by ghosts man calls god to aid and prays him to guard his sleep from the violence of the ways of hell the rape of the lamias that pass and the hymn of saint ambrose the te lucis ante terminum made still more precise the scattered meaning of these psalms gathering it up in its short stanzas unfortunately the most important that which foresees and declares the luxurious dangers of darkness was swallowed up by the full organ this hymn was not rendered in plain chant at saint sulpice as at la trappe but was sung to a pompous and elaborate air an air full of glory with a certain proud attractiveness originating no doubt in the eighteenth century then there was a pause and man feeling himself more sheltered behind a rampart of prayers recollected himself more assured and borrowed innocent voices to address new supplications to god after the chapter read by the officiant the children of the choir chanted the short response in manus tuus domine commendo spiritum meum which rolled out dividing in two parts then doubled itself and resolved at the last its two separate portions by a verse and part of an antiphon and after that prayer there was still the canticle of simeon who as soon as he had seen the messiah desired to die this nunc dimittis which the church has incorporated in Compline, to stimulate us at eventide to self-examination for none can tell whether he shall wake on the morrow was raised by the whole choir which alternated with the responses of the organ in fact to end this office of a besieged town to take its last dispositions and try to repose in shelter from a violent attack the church built up again a few prayers and placed her parishes under the tutelage of the virgin to whom it chanted one of the four antiphons which follow according to the proper at la trappe compline was evidently less solemn less interesting than at saint sulpice concluded durtal for the monastic breviary is for a wonder less complete for that office than the roman breviary as for sunday vespers i am curious to hear them and he heard them but they hardly differed from the vespers adopted by the benedictine nuns of the rue monsieur they were more massive more grave more roman if it may be said for necessarily the voice of women drew them out into sharp points made them like acute archers as it were in gothic style but the gregorian tunes were the same on the other hand they resembled in nothing those at saint sulpice where the modern sources spoilt the very essences of the plain chants only the magnificat of la trappe abrupt and with dry tone was not so good as the majestic the admirable royal magnificat chanted at paris these monks are astonishing with their superb voices said durtal to himself and he smiled as they finished the antiphon of our lady for he remembered that in the primitive church the chanter was called fabarius cantor eater of beans because he was obliged to eat that vegetable to strengthen his voice now at la trappe dishes of beans were common perhaps that was the secret of the ever young monastic voices he thought over the liturgy and plain chant while smoking cigarettes in the walks after vespers he brought to mind the symbolism of those canonical hours which recalled every day to the christian the shortness of life 
in summing up for him its image from infancy to death recited soon after dawn prime was the figure of childhood tierce of youth sext the full vigour of age none the approaches of old age while vespers were an allegory of decrepitude they belonged moreover to the nocturnes and were sung about six o'clock in the evening at that hour when at the time of the equinoxes the sun sets in the red cinder of the clouds as for compline it resounds when night the symbol of death has come this canonical office was a marvellous rosary of psalms every bead of each of these hours bore reference to the different phases of human existence followed little by little the periods of the day the decline of destiny to end in the most perfect of offices in compline that provisional absolution of a death itself represented by sleep and if from these texts so wisely selected these sequences so solemnly sealed durtal passed to the sacerdotal robe of their sounds to those pneumatic chants that divine psalmody all uniform all simple which is plain chant he had to admit that except in benedictine cloisters an organ accompaniment was everywhere added that plain chant had been put forcibly in modern tonality and it disappeared under vegetations which stifled it became everywhere discoloured amorphous and incomprehensible only one of its executioners niedermeyer showed himself at least pitiful he tried a system more ingenious and more honest he reversed the terms of torture instead of wishing to make plain chant supple and to thrust it into the mould of modern harmony he constrained that harmony to bend itself to the austere tonality of plain chant he thus preserved its character but how far more natural would it have been to leave it solitary and not obliged it to tow an useless companion and awkward following here at least at la trappe it lived and spread in all security without treason on the part of the monks there was always sameness of sound it was always chanted without accompaniment in unison he was able to satisfy himself about this truth once more after supper that evening when at the end of compline the father sacristan lighted all the candles on the altar at that moment in the silence of the trappists on their knees their head in their hands or their cheek resting on the sleeve of their great cowl three lay brothers entered two carrying torches and another preceding them with a censer and behind them a few paces came the prior with his hands joined durtal looked at the changed costume of the three brothers they had no longer their robes of serge made of bits and scraps stained mud colour but robes of violet brown like plums on which was spread the white twilling of a new surplice while father maximin vested in a cope of milky white woven with a cross in orange yellow placed the host in the monstrance the thurifer put down the censer on the coals of which melted tears of real incense contrary to what takes place in paris where the censer swung before the altar sounds against its chains and is like the clear tinkling of a horse which as he lifts his head shakes his curb and bit the censer at la trappe remained immovable before the altar and smoked by itself behind the officiants and every one chanted the imploring and melancholy antiphon parque domine then the tantum ergo that magnificent song which could be almost acted so clear in their changes are the sentiments which succeed each other in their rhymed sequence in the first stanza it seems indeed to shake the head gently to put forward the chin so to speak so as to affirm the insufficiency of the senses to explain the dogma of the real presence the finished avatar of the bread it is then admiring and reflective then that melody so attentive so respectful does not wait to affirm the weakness of the reason and the power of faith but in the second stanza it goes forward adores the glory of the three persons exults with joy only recovers itself at the end where the music adds a new sense to the text of saint thomas in avowing in a long and mournful amen the unworthiness of those present to receive the benediction of the flesh placed upon that cross which the monstrance is about to trace in the air and slowly while unrolling its coil of smoke the censer spread as it were a blue gauze before the altar while the blessed sacrament was lifted like a golden moon amid the stars of the tapers sparkling in the growing darkness of that fog the bells of the abbey sounded with musical and sweet strokes and all the monks bowed low with their eyes closed then recovered themselves and intoned the laudate to the old melody which is also sung at notre dame des victoires at the benediction in the evening then one by one having genuflected before the altar they went out while durtal and the oblate returned to the guest-house where father etienne was waiting for them he said to durtal i would not go to bed without knowing how you have borne the day and as durtal thanked him 
assuring him that this sunday had been very peaceful father etienne smiled and revealed in a word that under their reserved attitude all at la trappe were more interested in their guest than he had himself believed the reverend father abbot and the father prior will be glad when i give them this answer said the monk who wished durtal good night pressing his hand end of part two chapter six